Up until now, we have been talking about the recording and the representation of digital images and the aberrations that are caused through the imaging process. But there's another part to image, which is, of course, the storage part. And back in the early days of computer vision and back in the early days of the web when we were recording and transmitting images, bandwidth was limited, disk storage was limited and very expensive. And so images were traditionally recorded and stored in a lossy compression scheme. And over the years, there have been many, many different formats. And JPEG has emerged as, for better or worse, the winner. Um, and so these days, just about everything except the highest end um, cameras are directly recording as JPEG images. And this is really important because it turns out that JPEG does some pretty funky things to images, and we really need to understand those if we are using JPEG images in our computer vision or imaging pipeline. So let's spend a little time talking about JPEG compression. So you have undoubtedly seen the types of compressions that I'm showing you right here. If you zoom into just about any JPEG image, you will notice some pretty funky artifacts. The, the most significant of which is this blocking artifacts where it seems like there's all these little cuts throughout the image as if it's been pieced together by these small squares. And we need to understand these artifacts because again, just like chromatic aberrations, just like noise, just like everything else we've seen, we need to understand these imperfections in an image if we are going to try to reason about the physical world from them. So let's start by talking about how JPEG works. It's actually a pretty simple standard. Um, we're going to start with uh, an RGB image um, where each color channel, red, green, and blue, is scaled between 0 and 255. So let's start with an 8-bit per channel, three-channel RGB color image. First thing we're going to do is we're going to convert that image out of RGB into luminance chrominance, YCBCR. The reason for this is that the color channels in an image are highly correlated. If I tell you the pixel value in the red channel, you've got a pretty good idea of what the, what the value in the green and the blue channel is. And you don't want to be doing compression on highly correlated channels because it means if you introduce an imperfection in one channel and not in the other, it's going to magnify the imperfection. And so by converting to luminance and chrominance, we decouple the channels a little bit. And the other advantage here is that the human visual system is less sensitive to color, these two chroma channels down here, than it is to the luminance channel, which tells you how bright something is. So here I've taken the RGB image and I've split it into luminance and uh, CR, uh, CBCR, which are the two chrominance channels. And again, because we are less sensitive down in, at color, the human visual system, we're going to be able to get away with doing a little more compression here than up in the luminance channel here. So the first conversion, I'm showing you the equation here. It's just a linear transformation. You can see I'm just multiplying the RGB values by this matrix and then adding in an offset. And now I still get three channels, but they're just Y, C, B, C, R. Optionally, what you can do is downsample the chrominance channel. So let's say that the image is originally uh, 600 by 800 pixels. You can make it 300 by 400 pixels. So throw away half the pixels uh, in both of the chroma channels. That's a huge saving right out of the gate. And the reason why that's not going to matter is, again, that the human visual system looking at images is less sensitive to color. Now, that may not be true of a computer vision system, but JPEG wasn't made for computer system vision. It was made for this, another reason why we should understand it. So this is an optional step. You don't have to do it, but if you want extra savings in many cameras, particularly the lower end ones, do subsample the chroma channels up to including a factor of four in each dimension. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the image and we're gonna partition it into non-overlapping eight by eight pixel blocks. So eight pixels by eight pixels. You got an indication, by the way, right now where those blocking artifacts we saw earlier come from. It's going to come from this uh, blocking that we do. So think about just tiling the image with these little 8 by 8 blocks, left to right, top to bottom. And now we're going to do the heart of JPEG, which is the discrete cosine transform, which itself is a variant of the Fourier transform, which is itself something that we will be covering later on in this semester. Uh, I'm not going to go through this equation right now, but I will say a few things about it. And at, at the exercise at the end of this lecture, we'll talk about this equation in more detail. What the DCT does is it converts, 
the luminance channel or the chroma channel, we're going to do each channel separately now, into a frequency representation, in particular in terms of the discrete cosine um, transform. So the way to think about the discrete cosine transform is we're going to take a small block all the way over there, a little 8 by 8 pixel block, this is the luminance channel, and we're going to write it as a linear combination of different cosines in terms of frequency and orientation. So frequency is left to right, top to bottom, low frequency to high frequency, and then the orientations are the vertical and the horizontal that you see here. So what are we doing here? We're saying that that little image block there, and in fact every single one, can be thought of as a sum, in fact a weighted sum, of all of these images here. Now, why would we do that? Why change that representation? Why go from pixels to frequency? And the reason is that in the frequency domain, again, it has to do with the visual system, the human visual system, is that we are more sensitive to these low frequencies than we are to the high frequencies. And so what that means is we can afford to throw more information away corresponding to these values than to the low frequency values. And the way we're going to do that is, so at this point, let me just pause here. So at, at step five here, something very weird has happened. So I've gone from RGB to luminance chrome, and it's fine, I don't care. It's whatever, it's a, it's a color representation. But I've gone from integer values now to this frequency representation, which is floating point values, which surely from a compression perspective is a very, very bad idea. Because now I have to represent floating point values, not just integers. But now is where I'm gonna get my savings. So the DCT does nothing to save you memory. But this step, the quantization does. What we're going to do here is we're going to take each frequency, each value associated with each frequency in the plot that I just showed you below, and we're going to quantize it. We're going to divide it by some number and then take the floor or the ceiling or round it. Okay, so what does that do? This is the heart. Everybody talks about the DCT as being the heart of compression, and that's sort of true, but not really. Where you really get compression is this uh, quantization step um, right um, here. So let's see what we have. So we start with pixels. This is a little 8 by 8 block of, let's say, the luminance channel. The values are integer values between 0 and 255. I've done a DCT um, transform. So this value right here corresponds to the low frequencies. This value right here corresponds to the high frequencies. And, and going from uh, left to right, top to bottom, it gets higher and higher frequency. Notice again, these are signed floating point values, very, very bad for compression. But now what we're going to do is we're going to quantize. And what do I mean by quantize? I'm going to take each value here, I'm going to divide by an integer, and then I'm going to convert it back into an integer, uh, in, in the whole thing into an integer. So for example, notice down here at the bottom, these are really small values, and that's because I've already got small values to begin with, and I quantize by a big number. If I divide by 10, for example, and then take the floor, everything between 0 and one, 9 is going to go to 0. Now, up top here, in these low frequencies here, notice that we don't really want to quantize so much because we really care about these values. So maybe we quantize by a value of 1 or 2, and so only, only very, very small numbers um, get squashed and everything else gets retained. And so what is the benefit here, by the way? What is the benefit of doing this quantization? The benefit is notice that in this quantized DCT space, there's a lot of zeros. Why? Because all the small values from over here got quantized by something greater than one. And then when we took the floor, it went to zero. And why is that good? Well, encoding zeros is really, really cheap if you use entropy encoding. So the next step is to do entropy encoding or Huffman encoding or run length encoding where you say highly common uh, values get represented with very few bits and less common values get represented with more. Standard entropy encoding says that all of those zeros, which are the quantized DCT coefficients, are going to be very, very efficient to encode, and that's where the savings is. Now, obviously, on the unpacking, so what's stored in a JPEG has nothing to do with pixels. What it is is quantized DCT coefficients, which you then have to scale back to the original scale, inverse DCT, and then go from luminance to chrominance. And of course, all of that is happening uh, in real time on your device. 
because the savings from that is so significant that it's worth the extra computation. Now, you save a lot. There's no question. JPEG will save a huge amount of bandwidth. Um, try to save an image um, without JPEG and you will notice a factor of 10 more in terms of memory. But there's also a price to be paid. So let's take this image and zoom in on, on a particular area around that steel bar. And this is an uncompressed TIFF image. No compression. I'm just storing all the pixels, tens and tens of megabytes to store this image. And now let's JPEG compress it with a moderate amount of quantization. And you see all kinds of interesting artifacts. So first of all, number one, you see that blocking artifact. Why? Well, because I've partitioned the image into eight by eight blocks. And each block doesn't know about its neighbor. So it's doing a DCT, it's doing the quantization, and then you move on to the next one and it does the same thing. And it creates an edge between them, an artificial edge, which was not, of course, in the original scene. And that can be really problematic for a lot of reasons. Uh, number two, you sometimes just see these big blurry plotches because you quantized all of the high frequencies, variations in the image, and all that's left as in number two over there is this blurry patch. Number three, you see some interesting and weird color aberrations. And why? Well, two things. One is the chroma channel may have been subsampled, and the chroma channel tends to get quantized by a higher amount than the luminance channel, again, because the human visual system cares less about color than it does about intensity or luminance. And then number four is along what should be a straight edge, you get these jaggies because again of that blocking artifact is different along each edge. And so straight lines end up getting a little jaggy. And all of these are highly, highly undesirable. Now the good news is, the bad news is 20 years ago, because of bandwidth, because of memory, JPEG compression was really harsh. The quantization values were really large. We were hammering these images just to, to be able to store a handful of images on our devices. These days, memory is pretty cheap. Bandwidth is pretty cheap. Um, the quantization is not quite as severe. Um, but there are still going to be, in most images, some JPEG compression artifacts. And we just have to be aware of those. A little bit harder to undo, by the way, because of the severity of the artifacts and how persistent they are. All right, let's now uh, put all this to practice in this exercise. Uh, and I promise you before, we're going to go through that discrete cosine uh, transform in a little bit more detail. So let's do that right now. So here's the exercise. Please write for me a Python function that takes as input an 8 by 8 NumPy array of random pixel values. So just numbers between 0 and 255. It can be anything. It's a luminance channel. And an 8 by 8 NumPy array of quantization values and return for me, please, the quantized 8 by 8 DCT coefficient. So what you're going to do is you're going to compute the DCT. We're going to go through that in a second. You're going to take all of those coefficients, quantize by some value, divide, take the floor. And I don't care what you use the quantization. Set them to 2, all of them. Doesn't matter. We're just experimenting here to make sure we understand the DCT. So let's go through this DCT in a little bit more detail. So first of all, all the way over here, f sub c of u comma v is the DCT transform. So uv will go from 0 to 7, 0 to 7 for the little 8 by 8 block. That's what u and v are. Now, for the uv DCT coefficient, it is equal to the product of the alpha u comma v, we'll talk about what that is in a second, I define it right here, times the double sum over all pixel values, so x equals 0 to 7, y equals 0 to 7, so that's all the pixel values in the input in, in block of the actual pixel value, that's f of f sub c of x comma y, times this cosine term times this cosine term. So what you have to do is for each possible uv, u going from 0 to 7, 0 to 7, compute this double sum. Okay? So that's pretty easy to evaluate. Just take the pixel values, evaluate these cosines, and then sum everything up. And then that scale factor up front is simply determined as follows. For u equals 0 or v equals 0, the alpha u and alpha v are equal to one, square root of 1 over 8 each. Um, and otherwise, it's equal to the square root of 2 over 8. This is just a scale factor uh, to balance out the overall scale of the DCT. Okay, so that's the DCT. Pretty easy to calculate. Um, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to have a double loop to evaluate each frequency here. And then here, you're going to sum up over all pixel values in the block and the corresponding uh, cosine values evaluated um, at each um, x, y, u, v location.
All right, go ahead and give that a try, and then we'll go through my solution. All right, here's my solution for the DCT. Uh, as promised, we're going to write a function that takes in two NumPy arrays, b and q, b being the pixels, q being the quantization values. If we just go down here, you can see what it is. Um, I've set b to be just a bunch of random values uh, between 0 and 255, and I'd set q to be 2 at every value. Again, I don't care what the, what the quantization value is, and then I'm going to go ahead and call the function. All right, let's go back up. We're going to initialize d. That's going to be the dct to be a bunch of zeros, because I'm going to start filling in values. I'm going to determine what are all the x, y coordinates in the image. This is a mesh grid command. There's a couple of different ways you could have done this. This is probably the most compact way. And now here is my double loop for i in range 1 to 9, for j in range 1 to 9. So i and j will have the values 1 through 8. I actually want 0 to 7. You'll see in a minute I'm going to subtract 1 um, when I go to index. Here's I, A, I, A, I, and A, J as promised. It's either square root of 1 over 8 or square root of 2 over 8. And then now what I'm going to do is fill in the I, J, -th D, C, T. Here I'm subtracting 1, so now I'm back to between 0 and 7. And it's simply the product of A, I, A, J. And then it's, I notice I, I, I could have done this with two for loops, but I just did it with the built-in sum function of NumPy. So I take my block, I multiply it by the cosine, uh, each of the cosines, and then I sum everything up. I could have, this is just the most compact way I could think to do it. I could have had another double sum here across all of x, y, where I compute that double sum that you saw on the previous slide, and that would have been the ij uh, dct value. And then finally, at the very end, I just do a quantization here. So I divide by q, I cast into an integer. Um, whether you take the floor, the ceiling, or the round for this purpose doesn't matter. And then I return that as a NumPy array. Okay. So go ahead and try this. Um, there's a couple of ways to verify this. I will put this code online so you can go ahead and wire up uh, a, a fixed B and a fixed D and make sure that your code is returning the same coefficients as um, this. Now, the details of JPEG can be pretty gnarly, manipulating, and, and we've only sort of scratched the surface of a full JPEG coder. In reality, when you go to implement JPEG, you have to worry about all kinds of things having to do with floating point precision, um, having to do with how you do the truncation, whether it's a floor, a ceiling, or a round, having to do with, uh, with efficiency. You don't really want to do a full-blown uh, two-dimensional DCT because it's uh, quite uh, computationally intensive. We're not going to go into all of that because this is not a double E or an image processing course. But what I do want you to understand is where the artifacts are being introduced in JPEG coding. They're being introduced because of that 8x8 eight eight partitioning. They're being introduced because the chrominance, chrominance channels, that is the color, may be downsampled. And then most importantly, it's being introduced because of the quantization and the different quantization between the intensity, how bright or dark something is, and the underlying color. And they all lead to, can be some you know, not very pleasant artifacts visually, but when it comes to reasoning about the image, you have to be aware that there are compression artifacts. And in particular, when it comes to using machine learning and computer vision, you have to be aware that different cameras, different devices save images with different JPEG settings. And that means you may be mixing and matching different JPEG settings with different artifacts, and you have to be very careful in your data set that you are not introducing some weird JPEG artifact that will allow the machine learning to do nothing other than just learn a JPEG artifact. So these artifacts, just like all the other artifacts and imperfections we've seen before, are extremely important as we start to move towards reasoning about the physical world from digital images.